I want everyone to um, use their imagination now and imagine a day when you don't need your wallet. Nothing at all. Uh, women's handbags will definitely find more space for makeup and for that uh, pair of no heel shoes. Um, imagine a day where bankers are actually technologists from SUTD and not finance graduates from SMU. Uh, imagine a day when banks connect with you only digitally and uh, they use AI and data to provide you the fastest, cheapest, and the most integrated banking experience that you could not have imagined until now. Uh, and well, you know what? Uh, with MAS's initiatives, I think these changes could come sooner than you think. Um, a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Deeksha, and I'm part of Bloomberg Intelligence. We are an independent research offering by Bloomberg. And I'm really psyched to today to have Cecilia and Bindru on my panel um, to discuss how they are taking us to that utopian, virtual, seamless, invisible banking experience. Um, let me start with you, Binru. Uh, what is the friction that you are trying to address? Because we are, we are not there yet, right? We are not, and the reason is because there's a lot of friction, there's a lot of inefficiency, and where there's inefficiency, there's disruption. So what is the disruption that you are bringing about, and what is the inefficiency you are tackling? Uh, so it's a relatively broad question. Right. Uh, in one connect with the fintech arm of the China Ping An Group, and Ping An is a financial institution in China. Uh, so all our solutions is relating what the banks today can do, cannot do, or do well or not so well. Um, most of the frictions are relating in, in Southeast Asia mostly. Singapore aside, it's mostly relating to financial inclusion. So you'll find solutions like um, bringing the unbanked to to become banked, so unsecured lending, risk assessment, those are very popular solutions. Uh, the other aspect is in the area of um, better customer service, better, better user experience. Right? And that's probably more relevant to Singapore. Uh, so we have a whole set of EKYC solution. And this may be also in the area of cybersecurity. Right? So it applies differently. For the unbanked population in Southeast Asia, they use uh, EKYC to open up new accounts uh, in the remote areas. And then in Singapore, it's more for ease of use and experience, yeah. So um, it's very interesting because um, there are surveys that show that actually the unbanked populations in most of our emerging Asian countries, um, more than 70% of that unbanked population actually has access to a mobile phone. So technology really can move the needle in terms of inclusion, right? But so we've heard about a lot of disruption on the retail side. I know OneConnect is doing a fair bit on the SME space as well, right? Bankers have not done their job well, so you're kind of pushing them along on that. Uh, can you talk to us about that? A lot of times in the retail space, we think people want to be banked, but actually they don't really care whether they have a bank account. But in the SME space, uh, the SMEs does wants to be served better. So in a lot of countries, SMEs are not served well uh, due to many reasons, different processes, etc. Uh, so we focus a lot on SME. Uh, so our competitor, obviously, you know, is N Financials because they are also the SME bank. Um, we do a lot of SME um, one-stop shop service platforms, uh, financing solutions, etc. So in China, we have a platform just for SMEs and micro SMEs. Uh, in Southeast Asia, we're building one in Philippines, one in Malaysia, one in Indonesia coming up. So um, the, the, the larger vision is to have SME financing platforms in every single Southeast Asia countries that will ultimately talk to each other. Yeah, but of course, we're not there yet <laughs> today. I, I think from a bank's perspective as well, banking the SMEs is one of the more challenging areas, especially around the whole credit underwriting and underscoring uh, process as well. Um, before I move on to you, Cecilia, I actually, um, I know you're going to talk about payments. So I want to pull the audience uh, before that. Please bring out your phones. Uh, and yes, I want you all to be part of this panel. So um, the first question, what form of payment do you use while you're making purchases of less than $35 at a store? Do you use a credit card, a debit card? cash or a mobile wallet? And this is Singapore, so I do expect um, a slightly different response than some of the other countries, but let's see. Mm. 
interesting. I'm not very surprised that the audience in this room actually uses a mobile wallet. Uh, there are surveys that have shown in Singapore for amounts less than $35, cash is the most dominant form of uh, payment use still. Uh, the second question, uh, for more than $35, which is the most preferred form of payment? Yep, very clear answer, credit cards. So it is very obvious that when the disruptors come in Singapore, what business is most at risk? Credit cards. Now, the third question. Sorry, yeah, I know MasterCard is your partner, but I'm just kind of... <laughs> so do you go um, to the money changer to get currency before you travel overseas? And I want really honest answers about this. I know Singaporeans are really kiasu. All Asians are kiasu. So do you go to the money changer? For those of you who are trying to bluff me and tell me you use credit cards, can you tell me how much fees do you pay on your credit cards? Well, the answer is still very clear, right? It's majority um, people will go to change currency to a currency changer, possibly in the CBD or closer to home. Um, so yes, now you can tell me, <laughs> Cecilia, what is the problem that you are trying to address? Sure. Um, these are really interesting poll results. Um, so um, as a company, we actually focus on the cross-border e-payment space. Um, so why we love to solve this problem is because uh, we recognize that even in a place like Singapore, where everyone has multiple bank accounts, most likely, um, carry multiple um, credit cards in their wallets, um, actually the moment when we leave the country um, of Singapore, we automatically become unbanked. And that is actually where a lot of these fears or concerns and worries kicked in. Um, we are worried about whether or not we can access um, our money. We are worried about whether or not we can use the ATM. And that is actually the problem that uh, we want to solve. Um, so exactly a year ago, we launched Utrip. Uh, we are Singapore's first multi-currency mobile wallet that comes with a prepay MasterCard. So it allows travelers, um, a lot of us are super frequent travelers, to really span overseas globally without any forex fees. Um, so we have grown substantially since we have launched, uh, and now we are working on uh, re our regional expansion into multiple markets across Southeast Asia. So guys, all of you who travel a lot across Southeast Asia, a few colleagues of mine had actually recommended Utrip, so do try it out. Um, the other interesting thing is also, like, um, if you look at the way technology has influenced the banking sector, the financial industry, it's not something new, right? It's been happening on for decades. So in the 1950s, we had credit cards that lessened the use of cash. In the 60s, it was the ATMs. 70s was electronic trading. 80s saw the rise of mainframe computers in banking. And then 90s, there was e-commerce companies, how they changed the way you dealt with money, right? Uh, then why are we so fixated about technology again in the last few years, right? Um, and I kept wondering about, like, how come this is like the nth fintech panel that I'm attending and moderating, and people are still sitting in the room like 8.40 in the night? Uh, the problem is that the pace at which we are going, every single step we take from here, the impact is exponentially bigger and exponentially faster. So, so much so that we actually go into completely uncharted territories. And if you don't catch up fast enough, you are at the risk of not just falling behind, but actually going extinct. So what I wanted to hear, and let me start with you, Binru, like what exactly is the new technology that you think from here on will completely change the way that we are, uh, we are going to bank or the future of the banking industry? For home, I think the virtual banking licenses is going to be issued very soon. <laughs> so, so that's for home. But, um, you know, in, in Southeast Asia, um, I think the, the banks um, are very open to do more because um, they are, they're probably a little behind. They are looking towards China's uh, best technology to enable them. 
and out of good faith also China has invested in a lot of Southeast Asia countries making Chinese tech very well acceptable. Um, what we see is that um, in a lot of areas, uh, even innovative new tech, uh, uh, the banks are willing to try, right? And this is different from Singapore, unfortunately. Like for example, uh, for unsecured lending, if you have been in Myanmar recently, you'll realize that the, the Central Bank of Myanmar recently allows the banks to start unsecured lending. Uh, but the Burmese banks doesn't know how to do unsecured lending at all, right? And so um, where to get the data, especially in, in Myanmar, you don't even have people's IDs, not to mention, uh, so there's no credit bureau, there's nothing for you to check. Uh, but yes, you can do unsecured lending and people are getting excited about what do you do. So we have a technology that's called micro expression analysis. It basically uh, builds on top of a remote interview. So someone who wants to take a loan in far away in Myanmar, by the way, Myanmar is actually quite a big country, 50 million population. Uh, the largest bank in Myanmar tells me that just building uh, branches around the country will, will bankrupt him basically. So, so he is, he's not gonna build branches, right? So everybody will take a loan via a video interview. And what we've done is that we've built a micro expression analysis on top of that interview that analyzes your emotions as you answer these questions. Why do you need to take a loan? Where's your house address? You know, when, how are you gonna repay back, et cetera, et cetera. And it analyzes and picks up signs of anxieties. Right? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't tell the loan assessor that you are lying, it just tells the loan assessor that you are showing some red flags of anxieties. And, and this is a, a way, a form of scoring. It's not the only data point to decide if I should lend you money, uh, because you have to have other data points. Uh, but, but it's one of the newer tech that the Southeast Asia emerging countries are very open to. Yeah. She is just softening the blow by saying that's not the only factor. <laughs> by the way, in India, SBI actually launched this feature in their branches where they will look at facial recognition and figure out whether you had a good banking experience at the branch or not. <laughs> so that's another interesting, like, uh, you need to watch what you're giving out by facial expressions now. So don't just worry about your data, Malika. <laughs> we, we recently have added on top of facial expression, the analysis of where you looked at when you answer these questions. <laughs> so how many times you looked in a corner? What's the frequency? <laughs> and what, beyond what frequency is abnormal? <laughs> so it's getting very scientific. <laughs> how do you respond to that? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't launched it yet. <laughs> Perfect. So actually, let me pull you again. Um, just while we're on the topic of technology, uh, do you think fintechs have a superior technology stack than the banks? What's the view across? Pretty consistent, vehement, yes. So they've made life easy for you, Cecilia. Uh, do you think you have a better technology stack than the banks, or what is it uh, that's different. This is putting me on the spot here. Um, so I would say this is not actually how we look at it. Um, I think being a, a new fintech player, we actually have the opportunity to approach our technology differently. So to start off with, we actually don't have to worry about integrating with our legacy systems, um, like the ledger, accounting systems. Now many of you are laughing. Um, reconciliation process, batch processing of our reports. So not having to worry about integrating those um, systems actually allow us to take the viewpoint of our customers first. So when we decide to focus on the cross-border e-payment space, we really think about the user journey. So what happened? What is the person thinking when they're still in Singapore? Um, how they are thinking when they leave Singapore what happens when they come back and they have leftover currencies, for example. And we really, the first thing we do is actually to design a ideal product experience based on that user journey. And then we work backwards to our technology to deliver that. And uh, another advantage of being a brand new company um, is that um, not only do we focus on innovating on the front end, um, on a mobile experience, but we also took apart the, all the back-end operations, all the stuff that we just talked about, reconciliation, process, uh, settlement, reporting, um, everything else. We try to automate as much of that process as possible. 
Um, our goal is to completely eliminate uh, human intervention in those processes so that um, we can actually pass on the efficiency savings to our customers to deliver them a very low cost proposition. So that's how we think about technology. It's not so much about better or worse, but I think it's a, it's a different approach that we have taken. That's a, few, I mean, that's a very deep and very refreshing way to think about it as well, right? Like a lot of fintechs actually start with technology and then fit the customer journeys around that, right? But here you are starting by thinking what is the problem? And I presume you have pretty much the same partners as the banks have in terms of um, the merchant um, uh, base that you work with, right? So um, we do, actually. And I would say um, being a fintech at this point in time, I would say it's really, uh, we are very grateful. We are very fortunate. A lot of the same big partners um, are actually opening up to integrate with us. So whether it's our Forex um, partners who have very deep liquidity pool in the region or uh, payment networks such as MasterCard and many more. So I would say being a fintech at this point in time, it's really um, being able to do best of both worlds. On one hand, we integrate with very powerful systems with very good services and cost structure. Um, on the other hand, we also build out our technology from scratch. So we are able to deliver our um, front-end innovation a lot faster and much more efficiently. Um, so I would say we are, um, we are fortunate to be at, uh, at, this time in, at, at this point in time. So what's really interesting for me as well is that, as I just pointed out, credit cards business is the most at threat from the fintechs, right? And here we have a company which is like MasterCard's trying to self-disrupt itself. Like, like that's, that's how I'm reading it. So um, Bindru, you have, a, you have a different view, right? Like in terms of the tech stack itself. Uh, I remember you said that, of <laughs> course, we have a better technology <laughs> stack. So um, well, share your uh, thoughts. I, I'll first maybe answer, because I sell financial institutions. So I'm a fintech that is not really starting from a tech perspective because uh, in One Connect, we only sell solutions that's been deployed within the Ping An group. So we first have to test it out within our own bank to make sure it works before I can commercialize the product. And that means that I cannot construct a product without considering legacy, <laughs> without considering how uh, regulatory requirements of the banks. And we feel this is our unique value proposition. Uh, but having said so, so many fintech solutions, if they don't uh, do this, they don't uh, go through this, they will be lighter, faster, more agile. But the bank solutions are tested for scale, they are tested for robustness, uh, which is maybe something the fintech solutions don't have at this moment. Of course, the age of the solution is different, that's why the newer tech will be newer. Um, I'll, I'll give you one example, like when, when uh, the very, our very first mobile app that we want to deploy within the Ping An Bank couldn't work for us. And the reason is because it had a hard time integrating to the legacy core. Uh, and we tried, we spent a lot of money in the end, it was not possible, not commercializable at all because it was just too expensive uh, to make it work with the legacy. And so we created our own cloud-based lightweight core uh, to bundle it with our mobile banking app. That was our very first version. Uh, and then of course we asked the customer to buy both and the customer would go like, uh, why do I need another call? I already have one, thank you, you know? And, and then we, we don't have a choice, so we bundle it and we say that here, take the call for free, you know? You, you don't just live with one call, you can have, have another one, you know? That was our first version. And then, but today we have matured it in such a way that it could work beautifully uh, with a lightweight based call that we now today sell a lot to the virtual banks. So um, I think we've come along a, a, a journey, even though One Connect is five years old, the fact that we've gone through a painful journey deploying it internally, uh, make us understand a financial institution's requirements much better than a usual fintech. Yeah. So you've come a long way, and I think the banking system has also come a long way mm -hmm. towards you, right? I, I think like from within my coverage, and I look at the Southeast Asian and uh, a little bit on the Indian side, uh, the bank's awareness of the fact that they need to be more open banking compliant and they need to have a more uh, agile uh, form of uh, technology, right? So that is also really changing the way they are approaching technology and they're a lot more open to partnering with fintechs around that as well. Um, just moving on to the next section, which I think is something that we've discussed in the panels before us as well, um, data. Uh, I know both of you are gonna shy off from really opening up, but this is a closed door setting, so I really want to hear more candid views around. 
um, data and how you think that is going to sway the competitive landscape completely. So before that, can I just quickly poll the audience again? Um, who do you think has more customer data? Is it the banks or is it the fintechs? Wow. Okay, I have something to add to that result after, but let me hear from you guys first. So, um, Binru, um, thoughts? Um, I actually agree that the banks have more data. And the, the reason is because um, uh, there are different kinds of data. I, I think the banks have a lot of historical data uh, that is extremely important for AI to work well. So each time I have a new tag, yes, uh, and I want to deploy it to a bank, their historical data, the way they have collected it, the accuracy, the cleanliness of the data, will determine how the app is going to work well or not, or the algorithm is going to work well or not. So I, I, do, I do think the banks have more data. What the banks do not have, that the fintechs is gradually, increasingly uh, gathering, and they will only gather this data when you deploy it, when the banks deploy it. I mean, they hardly, may, maybe other fintechs collect it themselves. We, we help the bank collect alternative data points. So we deploy a new um, risk management engine that calculates risk from user behavior data, et cetera, or user experience. That These are data that the bank's historical data do not have. So we help the banks increase their data uh, to, a, to a better, more encompassing. How does it help yeah. them? How does it help them? I, I definitely think that um, it will help them in many ways. Uh, and in Singapore's context, mostly is understanding how the customer behaves. Because Singapore banks are maybe been comfortable for a while. <laughs> so, you know, and, and so increasingly the, the one thing to understand customers better, um, that's important in order to evolve. If Piyush was in this room, I can clearly see him coming up on stage. <laughs> he, he will hammer me, yes. <laughs> But um, it's very interesting for me that you say that because if banks had so much data and they never used it before and you're giving them more customer behavior data, um, are you helping them use it better as well? I think so. I think a lot of banks are setting up a big data team, uh, analytics team. I think more and more important, including payment, um, are using a lot of machine learning to analyze the data. So actually, I, I do see a big demand internally of the, the banks that are building up their own team. They are also looking for fintechs that had uh, good uh, focus, strength in, in certain areas to complement them. Um, I mean, unlike five years ago that banks are fintechs are competing, today is a, a very collaborative uh, environment. Every single bank talks to at least 100 fintechs in order to understand what they are doing out there. Yeah. <laughs> so let me phrase the question a little bit differently. Um, do you think banks are using alternative data a lot better now to underwrite better quality credit? Or do you think that's still a work in progress and not really quite there? Not really quite there yet, I think, yeah. Mm. The, the, the tech is there, the adoption's not quite there yet, yes. Mm. And you think fintechs are better at that? Actually, maybe I'll ask that <laughs> from Cecilia. Like, do you think fintechs are using the data better? Um, so for us, perhaps uh, we can share uh, an example of how, um, how data actually helps us. So naturally, as a digital company, all our customer interactions were digital. So we do naturally have a lot of information about our customers. And, um, and as a technology company, we certainly see every single data point as an advantage, as an opportunity. So one of our key priority, um, which you have also brought out, um, it's around security risk management. So as part of providing a payment systems, and as we are building out our technology infrastructure, um, we also build out a real-time fraud monitoring, transaction monitoring module that really focusing on using data analytics to study and analyze the transaction patterns um, in order to detect any uh, potentially suspicious uh, fraud uh, transactions. So actually, if you have followed us in the news, um, in the media, earlier this year, back in uh, February, we have proactively worked with the Singapore police force to catch a credit card fraud syndicate. Um, and um, it was only, uh, we were only able to discover because um, how we are leveraging our data, our information, and, um, and uh, really have a key primary focus on risk management as well. And uh, of course, 
uh, having a very safe program for all our users will continually be a key focus of how we think about our technology. So, I mean, that's spot on, right? Like, there was another insurance fintech that actually caught a scandal of insurance frauds just observing how data was moving, like how claims were being processed and what was the chain of claims that was going on. So, uh, to the point of the survey, uh, it's very interesting for me that startups, such as, say, for example, Grab, um, are masking some of that data and uh, depriving the banking sector from some of that data. So say, for example, you use your wallet to, do, to, to, to hail a ride or to pay for food or to order food at home um, using a Grab app. And the, the bank that issued the card that you used to pay will not see where you spend that money. So these fintechs, some of them are actually incrementally masking information uh, from the banking sector, even though the money is still with the banks. So it's very interesting how data dynamics could actually sway the competition in favor of whoever has the closest access to data. Um, I think we're closing uh, to, um, the time is kind of coming to a close. So um, I just want to ask you guys, what is the one main thing that you want everyone in this room to take away from our panel today? Uh, let's um, ask Vinru first. There's been a, and earlier in the poll, there's been a lot of talk about Singapore being uh, known and best to position Singapore in terms of governance, privacy, uh, security of the data. Uh, I would leave one point with the audience is that uh, we are already very strong in that space. Further strengthening this space will probably make us shy away from the latest tech. So we want to make sure that embrace the new tech in order to guard against it, you know, embrace the new tech with lots of cautious diligence on data privacy, but embrace it so that we're not left behind. Fair enough. That's a very fair plea. Cecilia. Um, so, so I think um, with all the new um, regulatory developments and so forth, I think um, the business model of banking in the next five to ten years will be dramatically different. Um, and I think that's why today, uh, what we are really focusing on is actually to build an incredibly strong consumer brand within financial services. And the way we measure ourselves, the metrics that we give ourselves is actually on user engagement. And uh, it also means that we actually don't really care how much money does the user keep in the wallet, in the balance at any point in time. We actually don't really care about that. What we care about is how frequently do they interact with our mobile app? How many times do they transact? And we particularly like payments as a product because I think on average, anyone would need to pay for things quite a few times a day. And also whether we, and also we measure how many times does, or how much interaction with the user has with us in our community events, both online and offline. To us, it's really about building the brand, really about gaining customer trust. And also, over the long term, we believe this will help us to build a strong consumer franchise within financial services. And um, that is where we are focusing on today. Did you hear the song? I don't have money on my mind, money on my mind. <laughs> I think the idea is that if you have the customer, the money will follow, right? That's, that's the broad idea. And I think Customer mindshare is becoming a very, very, very important currency. Of course, data is another one. But uh, the point is that if, and financials are not really excluded from that problem, right? Like retail, tech, financials are all just vying for customer mindshare. And once you have the customer, the money will follow. Um, well, thank you so much. I really had a great time um, having this conversation with you. And I'm obviously very interested in what that means for the whole evolution of the financial sector and the banking industry. And I think both UTRIP and the firms like OneConnect and UTRIP are really vehicles of change that are bringing us closer to that utopian, virtual, seamless, invisible banking experience. So thank you. Please keep charging ahead. Thank you so and much. And thanks a lot, ladies and gentlemen, for your time this evening. <laughs>